three cheers for Union Pacific. Hip, hip, hip hooray! hooray! This monument in Council Bluffs, Iowa, marks the eastern end of the Transcontinental Railroad, which was completed 125 years ago in 1869. Its construction was one of the greatest engineering triumphs of the 19th century, but it was much more than that. It began a genuine revolution in transportation across the vast expanses of the western United States. A quarter century earlier, only Native Americans and fur trappers inhabited the West. After his 1820 expedition, Major Stephen Harriman Long called these plains the Great American Desert, describing them as almost totally unfit for cultivation. Although inaccurate, his account discouraged settlement west of the Missouri. When the Transcontinental Railroad was completed, it uh, ushered in a whole new revolution in travel for people in the United States. It allowed you to go from New York to San Francisco in a week instead of months. Uh, it avoided long sea voyages, which uh, were common at that time. You could either go across Nicaragua or around the Cape of Good Hope. and and those were perilous journeys in and of themselves. It certainly killed Theodore Judah, who was the chief engineer and the chief organizer of the Central Pacific Railroad. Uh, or you could go by wagon or horseback across the United States and uh, uh, take forever, it would seem, take months or all summer to get just from uh, Kansas City to Oregon. And now you could do it in less than a week. The Transcontinental Railroad was a dramatic event. It uh, reduced time across the country by land from six months by wagon at extreme hardship to four days and seven hours at uh, much greater ease. Uh, it was five months around the horn by ship. It was six months by wagon across the country. And this, uh, just uh, in terms, in relative terms, this was probably the most dramatic event uh, in terms of time for travel, personnel travel, and uh, shipping. The Missouri River really represents to the United States the, the opening up of the West, exploration. Of course, everybody identifies with Lewis and Clark. And in fact, the Missouri River had been used uh, throughout the end of the 18th century and the early 19th century by fur traders. Uh, but they'd never been up, for the most part, it was just canoes and, uh, and small vessels that had been used um, to navigate the river. You, you just couldn't, the river was too shallow, it was thought, to get anything like a steamboat, a paddle-wheeled vessel up the Missouri River. But it, the, first, the first attempts were done in 1819 when the Yellowstone was sent up the Missouri River by the War Department in an attempt to do some explorations. And as we move into the second quarter of the 19th century, it becomes, becomes even more important to use steamboats to supply small towns of the growing United States along the Missouri River from St. Louis. St. Louis is the hub, basically, of suppliers for the development of the American West, especially as it relates to steamboat travel. Until about 1859, steamboats really stayed on the lower part of the Missouri River, um, supplying towns all along western Missouri and uh, up into the early territories and served to, to supply areas that were jumping off points for the Oregon and California trails.
As the pioneers reached the Rocky Mountains, the going became more difficult. The thousands of wagons that passed this spot carved these ruts in solid rock. As the grades became steeper, many treasured possessions were left behind to lighten the load. Hardship, privation, disease, and death took their toll on the pioneers. Of the 400,000 who began the journey west, one in 10 would not live to see their destination. Here at winter quarters on the banks of the Missouri River, 600 Mormon pioneers lost their lives during the bitter winter of 1846 to 1847. Many more lost their lives and were buried along the trail. Few of these graves were well marked. Rebecca Winters was an exception. While traveling west with her family, she died of cholera and was buried within sight of Scotts Bluff in 1852. As Burlington Railroad survey crews were laying out their line at the turn of the century, they came upon the simple wagon tire marking her grave and diverted the tracks around it. Now this is the edge of the Great Basin, the eastern edge of the Great Basin, and uh, the north side of the Great Salt Lake. This is dry country. They get about 10 inches of moisture a year, and uh, it really wasn't noted for much of anything except, well, of course, the Mormon settlement uh, east of here about uh, in the 18, 1840s. to 1860, it took six weeks or longer for news from the East to reach California. With the urgent political need to keep California in the Union, the Pony Express was inaugurated in February of 1860. Using tough, light riders and swift horses, the news could now reach California in a matter of 10 days. Pony Express riders changed horses as stations like this one spread every 12 miles across the wilderness. While the Pony Express lives on in legend, in reality it only lasted for 19 months, being replaced by the completion of the transcontinental telegraph. With the telegraph, news from the east could reach California in four hours. And then in 1862, gold was discovered in Montana and it became important that supplies be shipped up to Montanans who were in the gold frills. For instance, in Virginia City, where gold was first found in 1862, the population swelled from a negligible amount at that time, of white individuals anyway, to about 10,000 people almost two years later. So it's really important for those people who are out looking for gold, and that was it, to be supplied and steamboating then was used to go up the Missouri River, take supplies 3,000 miles from St. Louis all the way up into Montana. Constructing the uh, Union Pacific Railroad was a real problem. Uh, first of all, it was across what ended up being a thousand miles of virtual wilderness uh, with few trees, no habitation, to, or no human habitation to speak of. Um, in the beginning, it required bringing all the construction materials up from uh, St. Joseph, Missouri, which was the closest railhead to Omaha. Uh, the uh, Railroads coming across Iowa didn't reach Omaha until 1867, so for over two years we had to bring up every bit of construction material uh, from uh, St. Joe. We were 
pioneering in barge traffic <coughs> up the Missouri River. That's something most people don't realize. We had three boats, and I don't know how many barges we might have pull, pushed or pulled, depending on how they did it back then. I suppose they pushed them with stern wheelers uh, up the river. Locomotives came up the river that way. Um, and that's a feat that most people tend to completely ignore. Uh, the other uh, thing was that uh, Jack Casement, in my opinion, pioneered the uh, assembly line. He had uh, his crew out there working to lay the track, and each man had one job that he did all day long, and that was all he did. Uh, there wasn't any guesswork about, uh, well, now what do I do? He knew exactly what he had to do. His job was to put the spike in the tie or tamp the uh, dirt around the, sp uh, the tie, uh, bolt the sp rails together, uh, carry the rails, whatever the job might be. That was his job from Omaha for as far west as he chose to continue working with uh, Casement in the construction of the railroad. Uh, there really aren't any figures about uh, how many people worked constructing the railroad or how often they quit and said, I've had enough of this and went home. But the standard consensus is, is that there were uh, from eight to 10,000 people working on the construction of Union Pacific, including the bridge builders and the tie cutters and the masons and, and the tunnel builders and all the assorted people, the graders who had to set up uh, almost permanent cities while they were making uh, the uh, cuts and fills in some areas in Wyoming and uh, in Utah. When Union Pacific tracks reached the 100th meridian at Cozad, Nebraska on October 5, 1866, it symbolized the entrance into Long's Great American Desert. The opportunity for publicity was not lost on Union Pacific's directors. They organized a special train which arrived two weeks later for a celebration. The Union Pacific, the biggest thing they had to deal with uh, as far as external uh, uh, hindrance were uh, the Plains Indians. Uh, as one historian said, even the dullest native knew what this railroad meant for his way of life. And uh, so naturally the Plains Indians did resist, specifically Arapaho, Cheyenne, and Sioux. Railroad had some advantages in this in the fact that uh, they had several advantages. The biggest advantage probably was uh, the Indians' lifestyle. They were just a small group of people over a large area and their, neither their numbers nor their culture would allow a sustained siege. Also, the Union Pacific, it wasn't planned, but they had the good fortune of going along the southern edge of Sioux country instead of right through the middle of it, Sioux being the most numerous and the dominant tribe. And so resistance was sporadic. Also, the, the chief engineer Dodge and the chief construction superintendent, uh, Casement, Dan Casement, were, had served under people like Sherman and Sheridan and Grant during the Civil War. And any time they needed help militarily, they got what the, uh, the Army had to give. In order for a town or a city to survive in the plains, there had to be a railroad connection. Uh, when the Union Pacific was constructed, there were no towns, as we think of them today, west of uh, Grand Island, probably. North Platte uh, became a town because Union Pacific needed a division point and they wintered there in the winter of 1866. And beyond that, for sure, every town was laid out and platted by the Union Pacific Railroad. Sydney, 
Cheyenne, Laramie, Rawlins, all the way across, those towns were laid out and planted by Grenville Dodge and the engineers. And um, so in a very real sense, uh, you know, we were the, well, we had to. I mean, it was on our, on our right of way a couple of times, or our, our uh, land grant, excuse me. A couple of times we even moved a town a few miles one way or another so that it would be on our land grant land instead of uh, the government land. Plum Creek comes to mind, Lexington comes to mind as being one where we moved it about a mile to put it on our property instead of uh, government property. Um, and uh, it was just one of those things. It also promoted uh, a great deal of harmony among uh, the Union Pacific workers because you were out there if you worked for the for the railroad in uh, in Cheyenne, you very quickly became a big family because uh, there wasn't anybody else out there but railroad workers. Uh, uh, that may be too broad a statement. There were other people there, of course, because the railroad workers needed groceries and houses and churches and schools, but the whole town was organized around the railroad. And if the railroad hadn't been there, um, I suspect even Omaha would have a whole different history than it does. Uh, there wasn't anything in particular uh, to draw people to Omaha as opposed to Bellevue or Nebraska City. And uh, it was the territorial capital, but that got moved. And in spite of the railroad being here, it got moved. Um, so if you take the railroad away from Omaha and the capital away from Omaha, uh, there would have been no stockyards. And I suspect Omaha would have had a, a much different history, just as any other town along the line would have had if the railroad had gone somewhere else. Even though you had one railroad line, you had two separate railroad companies building this line from opposite ends of the country. Uh, Union Pacific started in Omaha, Nebraska. Central Pacific started in Sacramento, California. And both of them lobbied as hard as they could to gain as much control of this line. And uh, of course, they were getting paid for all the grading. Two thirds of the money they got for grading, the other third uh, for laying track. So when the graders came together as much as 200 miles ahead of the track layers, they just kept right on going. They hadn't been told to stop. There had been no point determined where the two would meet. The uh, government let both of them build as hard and as fast as possible uh, so they'd get it done as quickly as possible. So by the end, when they finally, when uh, the government stepped in and told the railroad companies, President Grant, newly elected, stepped in and told the railroad companies, you decide where you're coming together, I'm going to do it for you. Uh, the two railroad companies, Dodge and Huntington, each representing their representative railroads, came to an agreement that Promontory Summit would be the spot where the two came together. At that time, at the time they made the agreement, a month before the track came together here, there had been 250 miles of parallel grade built across northern Utah. It seems like I remember reading somewhere that the last Overland stage uh, across the Overland route, and that's basically the route that Union Pacific took, took was in 1868. We began running passenger service almost immediately. Um, and I don't think our fares were out of line with stagecoach fares. Uh, plus, it was certainly easier. Sam Reed, when he went from from uh, Atchison to Salt Lake to begin his survey. It took him nine days to go from Atchison, Kansas to Denver, Colorado by stage. That's seeing Kansas the hard way. Um, so um, the effect on the Overland stage was almost immediate. The effect on wagon train travel, I suspect, was just as immediate, although uh, you can certainly see photographs uh, taken in Nebraska in the 1880s and people are still uh, at least 
for the photographs purposes are traveling by wagon train uh, or wagon um, the huge wagon trains of the of the Mormon era and the California and Oregon Trail would have certainly uh, diminished significantly uh, with rail travel. We offered tremendous discounts for immigrant trains, so if you were thinking about moving west, you'd certainly want to do it by rail because you could get most of your baggage shipped free if you bought land. Uh, if you were going to the Pacific Northwest, it made a lot more sense to go maybe even as far as California and then up the coast rather than uh, trekking by wagon from uh, Independence clear out to uh, Oregon or Washington. Now you might think that in 1869, when the UP connected the continent, that that would be a death knell for steamboating, and that at last we could use a cheaper form of transportation to connect um, the continent and to get goods to the frontiers. But in fact, steamboating is still a factor in American transportation history, even into the latter part of the 19th century. Until 1884, the railroads, the northern railroads, haven't connected. And steamboating is still an important factor for Montanans in getting supplies. Even though supplies are shipped up from Corinne and Utah into Montana, they're taken to, by railroad, obviously, to Corinne. And then the supplies are shipped up for Corinne into Montana by wagons. There's still a significant trade that becomes important in the 1870s between uh, Montanans and Fort Benton and Canada along what's called the Whoop Up Trail where Montana and Montana suppliers are supporting the outposts of, of Canada at that time. And so steamboating again is important for supplying the American Canadian suppliers up in uh, Canada. But, it, but in 1884, uh, the, the final connection is made between the Northern Transcontinental Railroad, and that pretty much is the end of uh, steamboating, except it's the end of steamboating in the long run for long, long hauls. Um, there's still the short haul, obviously, in the small towns that are still surviving along the rivers and still need to be connected. There are still short runs in terms of steamboat transportation. And then at the turn of the century when you have the development of American roads, that is really the, the final end of steamboating and it fades away into the romantic annals of American history. The line as, as constructed from Omaha to Ogden hasn't changed uh, but uh, about uh, 40 or 50 miles since the original uh, line was constructed. Uh, a major change was uh, took place here in Omaha when they built the uh, uh, lane cutoff. That was an idea that Peter Day had had originally in 1864, was to go across uh, essentially where the line runs today. And uh, his idea was vetoed and they went down around uh, what we now call the old main line, uh, down Mud Creek through Papillion, and, and uh, instead of making the lane cut off. And then there have been some significant line changes in, in Wyoming. but. Uh, by and large, uh, the line that you ride on today is the same line that Thomas Durant rode on when he went out to Promontory in 1869. Building a railroad across almost 2,000 miles of wilderness was an undertaking of unprecedented proportions. 
It took a special breed of entrepreneur to turn such a vision into a reality. Oliver and Oakes Ames were such men. They were able to pull together the financing for the Union Pacific Railroad when few would gamble on an enterprise with no customers and an uncertain future. This monument in their memory was completed in 1882 at the highest point on the Transcontinental Railroad. But less than 20 years later, the tracks were relocated several miles to the south, leaving the monument forgotten in an empty wilderness. The Ames brothers were also forgotten. Scandal had tarnished their reputations and overshadowed their achievements. The true monument to their accomplishments is the pair of steel rails that still spans the continent. As the first automobiles arrived on the scene in the early 1900s, the existing dirt roads were little better than the wagon trail ruts of the previous century. As automobiles improved in reliability and range, demand developed for a system of all-weather roads. In 1913, the Lincoln Highway was established as the first transcontinental highway. This stretch in Nebraska was paved with bricks in 1920. As more and more roads were paved during the 1920s and 30s, America embarked on a new transportation revolution. What was it, the engine said, pilots touching head to head, facing on a single track, half a world behind each back? Bret Hart. 